Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. Now, over the last few years that we've been doing this show, uh, one of my very favorite things to do is sit down and discuss church history. And the reason that I love it so much is because it shows us when we look back in and look at the history of our faith and even just Western society, uh, we can see that we have a capacity as human beings uh, for all kinds of things. I mean, uh, there's not anything that you can put past us. Uh, we're pretty, pretty wicked, uh, very inventive for sure. But uh, it's really interesting to look back at the story of how the church has unfolded over time and, and the things that it's faced. Uh, it also helps us to uh, find warning for our church today, but then also it gives us insight into prophecy for the future. Where is the church going and what's going to become of her? And so if this kind of thing interests you, I want to remind you that our YouTube channel uh, has a folder a playlist uh, devoted to all the episodes of church history. And so if you want to listen to them uh, chronologically, as we walk through century after century, we walk through the last 2000 years, uh, you are welcome to do that. You can find it there on YouTube under the postscript show. Uh, last time we were together though, and we were having uh, this conversation about history, we were talking specifically about the middle ages and, and uh, more specifically the crusades now, today we're going to begin having a conversation that's analogous to that phenomenon, the Crusades, and that is the conversation of the Inquisition and, and what was the Inquisition and what was it trying to achieve. And so for that conversation, I want to invite and welcome my dear friend, yes. Greg Axe. Good to be here as always. Greg Axe is the professor of church history here uh, right. at LFBI. Mm -hmm. He is the author of Church History, the book. We're going to try to paint a picture in preparation All right. for a dialogue about the Inquisition. There's so m much uh, to talk about. Yes, very much. Uh, so we want to begin with the issue of heresy. Okay. Uh, what, it, what is heresy from a biblical perspective? Like when we look at the New Testament and, uh, and learn from the mm -hmm. Bible uh, what God thinks about heresy and how heresy was to be dealt with, what does the Bible say? Basically, the word heresy means false teaching. Mm -hmm. And so Paul identifies like people who are denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ bodily. Yeah. Uh, people who are um, denying salvation by grace through faith. Those mm -hmm. core fundamental uh, concepts of a New Testament faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And people coming along and teaching things contrary to that are called heretics or mm -hmm. heresy in the Bible. Uh, the solution for that that Paul gives in Titus is to engage the conversation with them a couple of times. He says after the first or second admonition, reject. In other words, you have an opportunity to talk to somebody who's teaching something false. Uh, sit down with them with the Bible and engage them in the conversation right. once, maybe twice, but don't get involved in endless debates with them. Mm -hmm. And after that point in time, you just say, okay, well, you believe what you believe. I believe what I believe. You go your way, I'll go mine, right. and we'll meet each other at the judgment and see what happens. Right. And so the biblical response to that is to engage it in the arena of ideas and conversation. And if you can't get anywhere, to let it go and go find somebody who wants to hear about Jesus. Right. Okay. The Roman solution to that, the Catholic solution to that is completely different. Right. They identify a heretic as somebody who disagrees with them, not necessarily disagrees with the Bible, but disagrees with them. Right. And their solution is to kill them. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different approach. Yeah. And I want to I camp out there because I want to address how, how we got there. Right. And so the Arian controversy is really what, what maybe um, solidified mm -hmm. the Catholic Church's uh, you know, perspective that they were responsible for uh, handing over or handshaking with the Roman Empire, uh, you know, in order to achieve some form of prosecution of heretics. Right. This, so this, there's a lot different between the first century Pauline type of heretics mm -hmm. and um, when the church was very small, uh, where every Christian kind of knew every Christian in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very easy to engage and to debate, you know, issues that fell outside of, of scripture. But 
But once Constantine made Christianity kind of the, the legal faith of the state, right. things began to change. And the Arian controversy specifically gave the Roman Empire space to basically hybrid the church and, and function in tandem. So maybe you can explain the, the inner workings of that. It, it gave them the excuse to carry out their brutal campaigns mm-hmm. of, of purging anybody who disagrees with them. Um, so in a nutshell, the Arian controversy deals with whether or not Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. Mm-hmm. And so you had argued, that's a core fundamental doctrine, right? So right. you have arguments on both sides of that and people coming up with their, with their positions on it. And again, the response to that biblically is simply to engage the conversation. If you don't get any word, move on. Um, the Constantine approach to that um, revolves around this concept of kingdom theology, mm-hmm. where the church now is the governing entity of the world, politically as well as religiously, mm-hmm. and any um, disagreement with them is an offense against the government and the state, and therefore we have the right to enforce that uh, and eliminate all enemies, mm-hmm. uh, which is was never God's intent for uh, for the church to do that. And so you have a system that's set up like that where now the government is the church and the church is the government, and anybody who doesn't line up, we we have the self appointed right to execute them, right. to purge them, so that the entire world will be Catholic or whatever, mm-hmm. whatever their system is. Right, and that's what led them to do that. So the it's it's one thing to discuss the points of doctrine; it's another thing to carry out murder mm-hmm. <laughs> in the name of your God, small G, to. To, to further your position on things. And that's where, it, that's where it went over the top with Constantine and others mm-hmm. that followed after him. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting too, because when you read the New Testament and mm-hmm. you see Paul's life, you, you read Acts, for instance, mm-hmm. Christians were always the underdogs, Yeah, right? They were always the ones that were being persecuted by mm-hmm. the Roman Empire. Now mm-hmm. suddenly the Roman Empire perceives themselves as the good guys. And there's not really a script in the New Testament for empirical, you know, dominion by a Christian body. Right. So the only thing that they could look at uh, uh, at what was theocratic rule Mm -hmm. or the look back at the nation of Israel and say, well, let's, let's see how the nation of Israel did things. Let's see how David ruled. Yes. And let's mimic that in a contemporary setting as though that's what a New Testament believer or New Testament, you know, system of government should look like. And it was, it was false. Yeah. In in a nutshell, it's what, what is called termed as replacement theology that uh, the church has taken the place of the nation Mm -hmm. of Israel goes back to many different things. But the, uh, the one driving factor behind that was Augustine's book in 400 AD called the city of God, where the thesis of the book is uh, here's what Jerusalem did in the old Testament, the nation of Israel. And they were, um, you know, they were to go into that land and set up a kingdom. And there were some military battles involved with that as well. Now we take on ourselves the right to do that in the church and Rome replaces Jerusalem as the city of God. That was the thesis of that Mm -hmm. book. And from that time forward, Constantine, Augustine, all that kind of stuff, it just morphed into this political entity that dominated the entire world. And eliminated anyone who disagreed with them. If we got to kill people, we got to kill people. So what? It's collateral damage. And yeah. it just that concept of, if you don't agree with me, I get to kill you. It is so totally foreign to what is common uh, decency mm-hmm. of, uh, of humanity. Mm-hmm. It, to, to, I just, I, I can't wrap my head around that. Yeah. Yet the, um, established church and government, which were one and the same for a thousand years, uh, took upon themselves to write the, the right to, d- to get rid of all dissenters. Yeah. And so in, this, in the case of the Arian controversy, the mm-hmm. easiest thing for Constantine to do was to go and find all of the bishops that were teaching this Arian theology mm-hmm. and basically exile them, excommunicate them, d- divide them from their congregations yes. and, and, and move them far away so that they couldn't have any more influence. And, Take their property, yeah. kill them if need, if need yeah, be. Yeah, they refer to it as penance, penance yes. for, your, for your crimes right. against God. And, 
And so then it, in that way, the Roman Empire receives financial gain by yes. taking ownership of the properties of, or, or whatever, whatever, you know, financial gain that this individual had mm -hmm. to take over those things. And then now they become the property of the Roman Empire. Exactly. And, and that, again, that concept is foreign to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Nothing in our uh, faith in the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, would prompt us to even consider killing somebody for disagreeing with us, mm -hmm. let alone carry it out. Right. And that's what happened. Yeah. And this went on for quite some time. It was a part of the Roman Empire's judicial system. Exactly. They were in charge. The empire was in charge of executing judgment over heresy. Mm -hmm. And um, and it really, the, the church, other than maybe having a, a peripheral theological framework, right, uh, didn't have much involvement. The Roman Empire just kind of did what they needed to do. They'd exactly. spot a heretic, and upon their discretion and their their choosing, uh, they would they would deal with it. Yes, and that happened all the way up until uh, the formal inquisitions began. Exactly, and that leads us to the the, the papal bull of eleven eighty four and uh, how it defined the early the early workings of the inquisition and how it was going to work. So now this. This had been formalized mm -hmm. in documentation. Uh, we are going to, um, we are going to, as the Catholic Church, now begin our own form of inquisition where we have the theologically sound, the trained uh, individuals within the Catholic Church. They are going to go and do the work of weeding out these heretics that are popping up all over. Can you begin that conversation for us? Can you help us better understand the early days of the Inquisition, what it was about. Yeah. Um, first of all, a papal bull is exactly what it means. It's a it's bull. <laughs> but the it, it's a shortened form of what we might call today bulletin. Mm. Um, and it is, uh, and another term, term to help identify it would be, it's like a, a, a Muslim fatwa. Um, and it's a declaration that this is heresy, and I get the the right to uh, to exterminate that heresy, and it's a bulletin sent out to everybody saying, "Here's our position on this. If you find somebody who is like this, you have the right to arrest them, bring them to us, or or execute them yourself, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to." And so that's where it comes from. It was instituted from the uh, basically it was a response to the failure of the Crusades, mm. and they, the Crusades were an abject, miserable failure. Uh, they were promised God wills it, and they went over there, and they just got toasted. Yeah. Um, and especially the Children's Crusade, uh, just the abject, miserable failure of 50,000 children throughout Europe dying mm -hmm. or being sold into slavery. People were starting to go, um, if God wills it, why are 50,000 of our children gone? Right. And And so in response and reaction to that, Pope Innocent III, um, who was responsible for the Children's Crusade, uh, claimed that a letter was forged to uh, from the Albigensians, which was a, a Bible-believing uh, group in, in, in France. One of these heretical sects. One of the heretical <laughs> right, sects. Yeah. He blamed them for it mm. by claiming they had forged a letter that supposedly had given rise to the Children's Crusade. And so the bull was issued to... Uh, hunt down those who disagreed with us, um, and it would be it would fall under general uh, uh, groups like Jews, Muslims, and others. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jews and Muslims were sort of lumped together a yeah. little bit, and we're going to talk about them a lot during the Spanish Inquisition. Yeah, when we get they to were that. viewed as heathen, and the Bible believers were views, viewed as heretics. We have right. to purge them. We have sure. to deal with. with I mean, there that were some Gnostics issues. and some some sure. crazies in the heretical mix. There always is. But there was also people that we would consider to be at least akin doctrinally to where somewhat yes, in okay. that they weren't they weren't pro papal government. They weren't pro penance and sacraments. They weren't you know they they took a, a much more uh, literal view of scripture the way they, that we do. They just believe their Bible. Yeah. And the Catholics weren't into that. No, not at all. And so the fatwa, the bull, the uh de declaration was made to find these people mm -hmm. and purge the church and yeah. society as a as a whole from them. Eradicate these sects. Eradicate the sects. Yes. Yeah. 
So this was a zero, a zero tolerance approach that mm-hmm. they were taking. Um, but, you know, as, as time passed from that original bull, mm-hmm. uh, there continued to grow more and more policy. And you mentioned Innocent the Third. And so he was really important in this narrative because he introduces the use of the Dominicans and the Franciscans yes. to go and, and do these inquisitions. And so who are the Dominicans and who are the Franciscans? What do they have in common and, and why were they employed to do this? Well, work? these were monastery groups or groups of monks, if you want to call them that. Uh, they, uh, Dominic, uh, St. Dominic in the Catholic Church wanted to help fight this heresy within the church. And so he and Pope Innocent and others as well established these orders of monks who would go into the monasteries. And, you know, we, we, we look at the monasteries of, of that time and we think, well, these are, you know, institutions where people get together and just pray and read the Bible again. And no, they weren't. Okay. Right. Um, they were military camps for, um, in, in a lot of cases, they were mm-hmm. like that. And St. Dominic was like that as well. Uh, he was, uh, his, his Dominican order was founded around the same time as Pope Innocent, around 1200 or so, 11, late 18, late 11s to, tw- to 1200. And they were nicknamed the Hounds of the Lord mm-hmm. because they would go out and hound people to death. And they were militarily equipped to go out and root out that type of heresy and bring it to, uh, bring it to judgment. Mm-hmm. And so we see the Dominicans today. I mean, the Dominican Republic is named after him. Mm-hmm. And St. Dominic is a critical figure in church history for that type of um, position that it's militaristic to go find these people and hunt them down and, and, and deal with them. And so him and the Franciscans and other orders of monks took it another step rather than simply just going into a cloister somewhere and praying and reading the Bible and preserving documents and um, planting farms and those right. kind of things. Making which some cheese of them and wine. Did. Yeah, which <laughs> many, many of the monasteries right. did at that time. They took it to the next level and became mm-hmm. military. Yeah, and so they were selected because of their, their organizational prowess. yes. But then also, they these were the trained in, in theology. Mm-hmm. You know, the idea was that the inquisitions up to this point uh, were comprised of lay people who would, you know, in their best, the best of their abilities, or governmental officials who, to the best of their abilities, would spot what they think is heresy, and mm-hmm. and it created a mess for the government. Yes. And and so this was a way for the papal order to get involved and send out what they believed were the most biblically <coughs> sound mm-hmm. people uh, to go find these heretics. Now, h- how did it work? Like the way I've, I've read is that in, in most cases, they would kind of announce that they were coming into a town. They would, they would say, okay, we're going to visit such and such city on such and such date, uh, get your accusations uh, ready Pre- they, prepare they would, yourselves. Yeah, they would do some of that. And yeah. sometimes they would be announced and sometimes they wouldn't be announced. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you talk about it individually, uh, many times they wouldn't be announced. Someone would be suspected mm. of ha- having heretical positions. Maybe they would be seen hanging out with the wrong crowd. Or maybe right. they would say something that disagreed with the, um, with the priest um, and they would be watched mm-hmm. and on an individual level. And then they would be spied on and all those kind of things. Uh, if they showed that they were ed- more educated than the priest, oh, that must be a heretic because he knows more than the priest do and they didn't know anything. Right. right? Um, but yeah, they would go into certain areas and towns and the old um, line of go into this particular count- town, kill them all, let God sort them out uh, was sort of the mindset uh, of this. Um, and 50,000 Jews in Castile, France were executed in one campaign. Um, we see this particular area as a breeding ground for heresy because they had a lot of Bible believers there. So we're going to go in and march on that particular city. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they would announce and sometimes they would not. Right. Um, they would just come in and kill them. Right. Okay. Uh, but Inquisition specifically is targeted at groups or individuals who are suspected of holding heretical positions, and again, heretical to the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So they would be identified, watched, and 
arrested most of the time in the middle of the night without any announcement. These different um, her- heretics, mm-hmm. we, we briefly mentioned that they're kind of comprised of different groups, but there are some dominant groups of the time that yes. were considered to be heretical. Yeah. Uh, who were those individuals and, and what made them enemies of, of the church? Well, um, they would be grouped sometimes by their um, location, like the Albigensians were in a region of South France called Albi. That's mm-hmm. why they were called the Albigensians. Um, and that area became the Bible belt of its day, if you want to put it in context that we might mm-hmm. understand. You know, the, uh, there's certain areas of the country and of the world even that identify with various religious um, titles to them. Salt Lake City, what do you think of? Yeah, okay. Bible Belt in the South, what do you think of? You think of, you know, folks that go to church on a Baptist. These were growing communities of people with a particular view. uh, With a particular view. So they would be identified by their region sometimes, sometimes like that. And then you would have groups like maybe the Paulicians who were identified because they got their doctrine from Paul. That's mm-hmm. why they were called Paulicians. Mm-hmm. Okay. So these are all the groups you you read about these groups the in history, Waldensians, yeah. were, which were followers, which, which were a group that were started by Peter Waldo, Waldo Waldensians. Mm-hmm. So, so they get identified with a person or a region or a particular doctrine that they have. And, and so as that happens, as that group grows, uh, in the region or in the area, they become targets of the Inquisition. We have to root them out. Yeah. So maybe give us some examples of what these doctrines look like. So like for the Waldenses, for instance, mm-hmm. um, the followers of Waldo, what, who was he and, and what were their beliefs and what made them so they were targeted? Simple, they were simple itinerant preachers, if you want to call it mm-hmm. that. They, they believed that the Bible should be the authority rather than the uh, rather than the governmental Roman church, mm-hmm. and that people should actually have a Bible and pe- people should actually be able to read it or um, uh, at least understand its core doctrines. So Peter Waldo was a guy that just wanted to go out and share the simple gospel. He was with a street people. preacher. Yeah, he was a street yeah. preacher. Okay. And he appealed to the Pope to give him permission, and the Pope denied it. And he said, Well, I'm going to go do, do it anyway. And this, yeah. is the, this is the common thread of individual New Testament conversion and salvation by faith in, in the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, rather than the ecclesiastical institution uh, of the church that's going to get everybody in there because we are the institution. Yeah. And, and so whenever that happens, it's a threat to the institution. They've got to, they've got to eliminate it. Right. And, and Waldo was seen as theologically unsound because he was untrained and, yeah. and, he, he was a guy like us. He was like us. You didn't go to our school, right. therefore, yeah. And and he uh, was one of the first people to translate or get the Bible translated from the Latin into English so that the common well, person John, could have. John Wycliffe was the guy that did that. It was around the same time, mm-hmm. too. Um, and Waldo was a little bit earlier than him, but he he wanted people to understand the basic things of, of salvation Right, you know, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and so that was his main. Um, that was his main issue. He wanted to go just tell people about Jesus, mm-hmm. and he was not allowed to do so, no. and he did it anyway. Right, and people responded to that and followed him, and that's why they became uh, known by that tag. But those particular groups would spread through through Europe throughout that time because God's not put in a box that mm-hmm. way. And his truth is going to make it into people's lives when they want it. No matter how, what efforts the Catholic Church made to stamp it out, it always manifested itself some other place. Mm-hmm. And and I, I, one of the things I read was that yeah. the port cities, because of travel, mm-hmm. um, that port cities were hotbeds for these, you know, sects or, or these heresies. Right. And um, and then they would spread from there out into the yep. countryside, and and so they would often these tribunals, which mm-hmm. I want to talk about that because that's a that's a term that they use for a, a group of Dominicans or whoever it was that would go into a community and then they would prosecute. They were called tribunals. Yes, they would go to port cities specifically um, in order to weed out these these heretics. Yeah, because that's where a lot of commerce is taking place, and of course, there, with commerce becomes the exchange of ideas as well. Yeah, so so tell us about the tribunal and tell us about 
when an investigation was went the way it was supposed to go. You know, we know that there was these kind of fly by night, come in, grab the guy, you know, um, do what you need to do. But but generally there was supposed to be a system in order that ended with the judgment being executed by the the local Roman government, whatever that governance was at the time. Can you walk us through what an investigation was supposed to look like in the eyes of, of the papal inquisition? Let's take a moment right here to hear from Pastor Mike Renault of Living Faith Boston. Hi, I'm Mike Renault, pastor at Living Faith in Boston, Massachusetts. And if you're considering learning the Word of God, Living Faith Bible Institute would be a good place for you. The good thing about LFBI is that you're not just learning from an academic standpoint. You're learning from actual practitioners that do in fact know the book. These are pastors and men who are leading churches, doing the work themselves, since they can give you a firsthand real life knowledge of what it means to learn the Bible in that context. Some of you may have a call in your life for the pastorate uh, to be a missionary, to serve the Lord in other parts of the world. Living Faith Bible Institute can prepare you in a way that you can be equipped with the Word of God and given practical tools, being held accountable in your ministry right where you're at. If you're interested in learning more or you want to enroll in LFBI, go to lfbi.org. Can you walk us through what an investigation was supposed to look like in the eyes of, of the Papal Inquisition? Well, they were not as organized as you would think today. When we think of an investigation or an area or a so where we're going to go in, we're going to find something here. We're going to do a thorough investigation and then take this case to court and go through that. Those systems were not in place the way that they are today. And uh, as a matter of fact, the inquisitions themselves are the basis for uh, our legal system today and the reaction to what took place in the inquisitions because they were not organized. Mm. Uh, they were somewhat but not like they are today. So a group would talk about group wise, a group of Albigensians or Waldensians would be found in a particular location. Word would get back. We got to go in there. Mm -hmm. And the tribunal would try. It's a, it's a court case for lack of a better term, but the, there was no structured, let's go to court and present your evidence. And we present ours and a right. judge decides they, the decision was already made before mm -hmm. they showed up. Yeah. Um, so you weren't, you weren't entitled to defense. There's no due process. Right. None. You ha I, I read that you were mandated. You had to defend yourself. You had to speak on your own behalf. You have to show up. You have to defend yourself. Not only you have to defend yourself, you have to testify against mm -hmm. yourself. Uh, and if you won't testify against yourself, we'll torture you until you do. Yeah. Which I think is the big thing is that, what they were looking for was a confession so yes. that someone could pay penance. Yes. When they didn't get a confession, uh, and they were obviously when they came in, they were they already felt justified. They they felt they already had an answer. This is a heretic, regardless of of his defense. The mind was made up before Their mind they got was there. Made up. Yeah. So they turned to torture mm -hmm. was the next natural thing if someone doesn't conf confess. What kind of torture you know are we talking about here? I mean. That we're, ta they, we're talking about the medieval time frame. Yes. And again, civilized people wrapping their head around this is very difficult to do. The, the methods of torture would be uh, all sorts of different mm -hmm. things. The, 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 anything that they could do to inflict pain on an individual to get them to testify against themselves, um, you know, without getting gory about it, you know, cutting fingers off and mm -hmm. driving things underneath their fingernails and lighting torches under their armpits and various things like that. Mm. Just whatever they could do to, um, um, to exact a confession out of somebody, whether they were, 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 whether it was true or not, it didn't matter. Truth didn't matter. Right. Purging anybody who disagrees with us is the only thing that right. matters. Which is the really interesting thing because I, when you think about it, you know, in our judicial system today, we would rather let a free person or a, a, a guilty person walk away free mm -hmm. if we don't have evidence, yes. right? Like 
in the, the way that we think as Westerners is it's better to have someone who may be guilty on the street than to accidentally prosecute and condemn someone who didn't do something. Exactly. So if we don't have the evidence, well, then we have to let that individual go. That's the way due process works. Yes. But in this world, right, mm -hmm. uh, they were insistent, at least from their perspective, on truth. They were less concerned about who was guilty or who was, they were so obsessed with this idea of getting to the truth that they were willing to forego what we would con consider to be, you know, um, proper human digni exactly. you know, dignity. Exactly. And, and, and it was the purity of their institution mm -hmm. uh, and truth in their eyes. Right. Not yeah. just truth. Subjective okay. truth. Subjective. This is what we believe to be true. And if you don't agree with us, we have the right to execute you. Mm -hmm. And if we think you're lying to us, we'll, we'll, we'll get the, we'll get the torture things out yeah. and go after you to, to, to do that. And that's what would happen. They would go into group, into, into cities and they would hold public tribunals at times. And then there would be, um, private yeah. arrest as well. And these, and these public hearings were really interesting too, because it, in these smaller towns, you have fairly uneducated people. Mm -hmm. If someone in the community disliked someone else, mm -hmm. um, they could make an accusation that was completely fallacious. Yes. But the accusation had to be taken seriously because if it wasn't, then it undermined the authority of the Domin Dominicans or whatever tribunal was present. Mm -hmm. And so they would take almost ev every accusation at face value. Uh, which I find to be very pro problematic. <laughs> yeah, very, very problematic because we don't need the evidence. We we also have to understand the feudal system of mm -hmm. the way things operated at that time as well, which is the totalitarian government um, with the minor, you know, half a percent of elites at the top, a few underneath that that were uh, hired by them or, or protecting the land or whatever you call it. And then you got 98% of the population right who is oppressed, suppressed, uh, not educated, um, and not allowed to be mm -hmm. educated, not allowed to own anything. Um, their existence was for the benefit of the state. And so when the state decided that that group no longer served their purpose, well, then we have to eliminate them. Yeah, it's an incredible way of keeping people oppressed. Whether it was true or not didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so what would happen in terms of punishment? Like for the most part, I think that the papal authorities wanted to keep their hands clean from execution itself. Hmm. So they would kind of at the end of their, their stay in a town, they would say, okay, here's the guilty. Uh, here's the tortured. Here's those who've confessed. And, and this is their agreement to give penance um, you know, this much of the land will go to the local authorities here. Mm -hmm. And then this part of the land will, will be the fee that the conveniently that we'll take for our yes. time. Um, we'll, we'll take some of this land and we'll sell it or whatever we'll do. But then the punishment was left in the hands of the local authorities and they were given the responsibility to execute people publicly yes. in, in most and, cases. Yeah. And it was like public examples mm -hmm. and it was again, designed to keep the population in fear of offending the government so that we could, they could just live their lives. And so it's a reign of terror that was designed to keep everybody under control. Mm -hmm. And then those that were confessors would often wear like a symbol of their confession. They'd be placed in a, in a proper Catholic church somewhere mm -hmm. and they were, they were forced for at least a time period to wear the a, lucky ones. Yes. Yeah. The lucky ones would wear like a, a, a yellow cross or a red, a red cross in different instances and they were for forced publicly. People would see that, oh, this person was previously a heretic. And of course, there'd be shunning and yes. whatever, whatever things at the community. Right. And they were the lucky ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So how did, this, how did this impact communities overall, right? So these groups would just take off. You know, they'd do their thing in a town and they'd leave. What was the aftermath? What was left behind in their wake? Well, the aftermath is the fear of this happening again and happening to me. Uh, so I'm going to toe the line and yes, sir, to whatever um, I'm told to mm -hmm. do and continue to be the serf for the elites. 
Mm-hmm. That, that's basically the 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 way yeah. that it manifests itself. It's not a whole, a whole bringing lot. the group underneath oppressive control, mind control. Yeah, which there's no freedom in that. No, um, in no. terms of decision making, you know, no one can make a proper, clear headed decision about any sort of faith system or belief if they're under the gun. Yeah, and and this is how oppressors function. Like in Africa right now, this mm-hmm. is the this is the wave, the terroristic wave of Islam that is working its way. Th- south through the continent of, of Africa mm-hmm. is setting up shop, um, th- threatening people, mm-hmm. uh, you know, either by violence or to cut them off from, from food or provision. Mm-hmm. Um, and then being willing to provide what's necessary for basic sustenance if you're willing to convert to Islam and, and then, then we'll take care of you. And, and there's no such thing as conversion genuine conversion in a world like that. No. But it's not, that's not a whole lot different than what we see happening in Islam in our mm-hmm. world today. Yeah, it's forced conversion, yeah. which is not conversion. Right. So we've got all this, you know, this is happening across Europe. Mm-hmm. These groups uh, of tribunals are just traveling all throughout. Is there any sort of oversight of how, like, are they answering to anyone? Is there Eventually, anyone that's over... <clears throat> Yeah, now this? So this we're talking eleven, late elevens, twelve hundred, yeah. somewhere. But eventually, the Roman Catholic Church set up what they called the Holy Office, but it wasn't until about fourteen eighty or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Holy Office was the um, uh, let me put it in context that we would understand. It'd be like a cabinet position for the president, okay? Uh, that was charged with the. Uh, implementation of the inquisitions and the purging of heresy from the world, not just not from the church, but from the world. Mm-hmm. And it, it began around the 1400s. It lasted till the 1800s. And it was a set office within the Catholic church. And that guy, whoever that person was, had his whole staff of people working for him, mm-hmm. a cabinet officer in our current administration would have a whole bunch of people working for him. Um, and, and that person had a whole bunch of people out there weeding out the, um, w- w- out the heresy. So again, it morphed over time, but right. it started out with, we have to purge heresy uh, from the church in reaction to the crusades. We failed this way. That didn't work. Well, let's turn it against somebody else. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and that's where, it, and then it got organized Right. Over a period of time, yeah, you know, we're talking hundreds of years of time, trying to compress it into a, you know, in, in, into a simple presentation, right? That yeah, they would understand it's very difficult to do. Uh, however, that's what happened, and eventually, by about fourteen eighty or so, this holy office was set up. That was the title of it, mm-hmm. and uh, the Grand Inquisitioner was the cabinet member of that holy office, right? And then he would, um, you know, have his eyes and ears in various different places reporting back to him, this person is a heretic or this group or this region has a lot of heresy in it. Let's go in and attack and mm-hmm. do what we need so to do. So early on in the, the medieval inquisitions, if mm-hmm. you will, it was a little less organized. But by the time yeah. we get to the Renaissance, mm-hmm. things are following the way of, of greater and greater humanistic perspectives and enlightenment and science and organization. And we're coming out of those medieval ways of thinking. Yes. Let's, let's formalize the inquisitions. Let's mm-hmm. make them more, you know, humane in quotes, you know? And so they, they begin to build this organization and the grand inquisitor actually had a ton of authority, at least in terms of documenting what was going on. Yeah. Or they were supposed to. Well, they, yeah, they were supposed to. Yeah. You, you, we, we say documenting it, but the documenting it in the mind of the mm-hmm. of the church, saying we be, we want to exterminate this particular group. Mm-hmm. And so then, with the formalization, then we see particular movements into regions, like you mm-hmm. mentioned, and uh, we this is where the the Portuguese Inquisition mm-hmm. um, comes to be, or the Roman Inquisition. Uh, or the Spanish Inquisition. Yes. Each of these were particular movements into areas. And uh, and and so maybe explain that a little bit to give us a taste of, of 
of what the Spanish Inquisition specifically was about, because we're going to devote a whole other episode to just the Spanish Inquisition uh, as well. So that was the mother of all Inquisitions, right? Yeah, and um, it was implemented for hundreds of years mm -hmm. as a reign of terror, specifically in Spain. Of course, yeah, that expanded to the Spanish world in the over here as well um, in in the Americas, yeah. uh, in South America as well. And we'll talk about um, later on as well. But um, yeah, you would find a region like that where we're going to lock these people down and bring them underneath our control. Mm -hmm. And it, it happened in various different areas like that. You know, as we close, because mm -hmm. we are going to, we're going to come back to this topic yes. and, and we'll uncover more of what was going on here. But in, in order to help us summarize, what was the, there's a stated objective, but then there's an underlying objective of the Catholic church, right? There, all, there always is. There's the thing right. that's, that's presented to the people. And then there's the, the actual objective. Can you summarize that for us? What was, the, what was it actually that the Catholic church was trying to achieve through all of this? The stated objective, to be simple with it, is the elimination of heresy. Mm-hmm. Here's Jews who don't believe what we believe. Here's Muslims who don't believe. And here's Bible believers who don't believe what we believe. We need to eliminate the heresy to purify the kingdom theology that we are dominating the world and we're going to bring in the kingdom for Christ. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I almost said Jesus. It's mm -hmm. right. the wrong Christ. Yeah. Okay. Um, that the public stated objective is to purge heresy. The underbelly of it which we'll get into with the Spanish Inquisition, is to keep its own in line mm -hmm. and to establish the reign of terror so nobody leaves the institution of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Okay, We see that a little bit. You made the comment of Islam. We see it a little bit in Islam today where it's not just purifying within. Nobody within Islam is allowed to attempt to convert even if they attempt to convert, mm -hmm. it's a crime against the state punishable by death. So that it's that reign of terror keeping their own in line. It's not just purging what's out here that's against us. It's that which we have here as well, holding on to it. Mm. And, and so it's about power. Uh, you know, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And the, the, I think it's important for us too, to, to put ourselves in the shoes of the people of this time period, because I think it's easy for us to be revisionist mm -hmm. in our perspective. It's easy for us in 2022 to look back on these medieval people and think, oh, how ridiculous uh, was this? How did the people, but the people were for this. Like yeah. for the most part, people mm -hmm. were like, they saw heresy as a serious world problem yeah. because they'd been taught to think that way. And we need to graciously understand that they saw this as a problem the way we see the way we see authoritarian or fascist rulership like mm -hmm. the way we would see the nazis for yeah. instance if if uh, the if the kkk um you know came into your town and and were beginning to infiltrate your town how might you react this is how they saw heretics exactly and so this is what they're told now mm -hmm. this was supposedly and again it's false but they're supposedly told this is the church that Jesus founded upon the rock of Peter and gave him the yeah, keys to yeah. the kingdom of heaven. And so this is the only church there is, and anything outside of that is 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 wrong, and we need to keep this as pure as we possibly can. And then you add to that the kingdom factor of the theocracy of we're, the government and the church uh, together. This is all they've known for hundreds of years. Right. We, we, we look at it and we go, oh, well, why can't they see it? you got to— like you said, give them some slack as to what what the world has been told for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And this is the pure church. It's got some problems, but we need to keep it pure as much as we can and purify what's in it. Uh, that that that's what they know. Yeah. And and so if they're trying to keep that pure, you you kind of half understand it, but then you don't. Right. Yeah. And so they were willing to, they were willing participants. Yes. Over, over time, obviously this changes. Yes. And, uh, and we'll get to that in the next episode. Right. But this is, to me, this is one of the most fascinating topics in the history of the church mm -hmm. because it's so egregious and it stands in such great contrast to how we understand, you know, um, 
religion today. Yeah, exactly. But there is potential for more of this. And I think that we also were blind to it in many regards, but there are inquisitions that are happening even in our world today. Which, Absolutely. Which the, I can't wait to talk about. Yes. And that's what we'll get into in the next episode. And this is why these kind of issues of history are not just about names and dates and facts and figures from something that happened hundreds mm -hmm. of years ago that I don't care about. Uh, because those who who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. And we have failed to learn the lessons of history and we are repeating them yes. now. And the Crusades, we're still living them today, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. The Inquisitions, we're still living them yes. today in some form. Yeah. And we'll, we'll see that as we unlock the Spanish Inquisition yeah. and what really took place. Awesome. Well, Greg, you're the man. Thanks for hanging out yeah. with me. Appreciate it. I always have a good time. Yeah. And uh, we're grateful for you. Thank you for listening uh, to this episode of The Postscript. If this kind of thing fascinates you, right? Like if you are always looking forward to the episodes with Greg when we're talking about history, we want to, first of all, again, invite you to go check out the YouTube channel where you can find all of those church history uh, Postscript episodes in one place. But we want to invite you to take the church history class, uh, which happens in a two to one and a half year cycle that we repeat over and over again. And so you can jump in uh, to that class. It'll show up in our program of study uh, pretty often. And so we want you to join us. Uh, if this topic interests you, you should come study theology with us. You should come study the book with us and know your Bible so that you can spot out or root out real heresy, um, not false heresies, but, but real heresies uh, that are all around us. There are false teachers everywhere. And, uh, you know, we live in a world where uh, Christians don't know their Bible very well. They, they're unfamiliar with what the Bible actually says. And so uh, we want to invite you to come be a part of LFBI so that you can learn the word of God and you can spot the real heresies that exist all around us. And you can see uh, the mission of Christ with uh, greater and greater clarity. But we love you. We're grateful for you. And we hope that you join us again next week uh, for another episode of The Postscript. God bless. Thanks for listening to The Postscript. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating and review in order to help other people find our podcast. If you value this show, please help us continue creating content by supporting Living Faith Bible Institute at lfbi.org support.